Hello, and welcome to the Keep It Local Maine podcast, where we tell the stories of local business owners, artists, and entrepreneurs, and learn more about what they do, who and what inspires them, their challenges, successes, and more. My name is Todd Regalinski. And I am Kimberly Regalinski. And we are the publishers of Keep It Local Maine, a magazine that helps to showcase local businesses to the people in and around their communities. Thank you for tuning in to our weekly podcast that you can subscribe to on most streaming services such as Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and others. You can learn more about us at keepitlocalmaine.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube through the links in the show notes. In this episode, we'll be talking with Tyler Hall from the Hall Group of Keller Williams Realty in Westbrook. Tyler began his career with a record-shattering 52 homes sold and over $12.5 million in volume, which landed him Rookie of the Year for the largest real estate agency in the world. He credits his selfless desire to serve as the catalyst for his massive success as a first-year agent, and since then, he has continued with his impressive sales numbers, all while running multiple other local industry-leading businesses. Real estate is his passion, but building growth through others is his life purpose. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. You are a main business. A Maine business. That means you're the backbone of our community and a force for good in Maine. At Gorham Savings Bank, we think you deserve a bank that sees your business as more than a balance sheet. Every Maine business deserves that kind of bank. Call, click, or come by to learn how we can help your business thrive. You're a Maine business. We're a Maine bank. Let's get to work. Gorham Savings Bank. Banking is believing. Member FDIC. Welcome to the show, Tyler. We are so glad to have you here today. Yes. Thanks for having me. This is great. I uh, just been following you and following your story and over the years and you just you you have a, such a great story. So tell us, you know, um, you've been a serial entrepreneur for, for most of your life. How did that start for you? Yeah. So that whole thing kind of I mean, I've always just been how do I make this work? How do I make life work? Because I, I come from a family you know, we didn't always have money. We just kind of did what we had to do. My dad was extremely hardworking and he provided a life for us that I have no idea how he even did it, you know? Mm. And I remember as a little kid, just watching, you know, my dad go to work every single day, coming back home. He never had anything. He always had ratty clothes on, but we always had, you know, fresh clothes, food on the table, a roof over Mm. our heads. And, you know, I always... I knew that we didn't have money growing up and, um, you know, I just didn't want that sacrifice that my dad was making to go to waste because he was Mm. working like he was working crazy. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want his hard work because he was just doing that to give us a leg up in life. And Mm -hmm. I didn't want his hard work to go to waste. So, you know, even from a young age, I just was always like, how can I help? How can I be better? And I just knew that I didn't want that same lifestyle. And I wanted to, you know, take the advantages that my dad was giving me and uh, do something with them. So, Mm. you know, I had done a lot of things growing up for money. Uh, You know, I was always known as the guy that had money. I, my family members, like aunts and uncles and uh, my parents would always borrow money from me even when I was very little. And, you know, it just kind of came to a point where, you know, in high school, you know, that's when things really start to get together because now all of a sudden you're getting your license Mm -hmm. and now you're, now you're needing to make a living. Mm -hmm. And so I actually, I had a friend of mine that his dad started a restaurant and he needed some help opening it up and, you know, starting it. And so I helped him with that. Um, and I didn't get along with the boss. And so, you know, I, I, that job only lasted me a couple of weeks and, mm-hmm. you know, I got my first paycheck. It was like a hundred bucks. And I'm like, you know what, this isn't it. You know, I, I just worked my butt off, you know, this ain't it. So right after that, the next day I started a lawn care company and just started advertising on Craigslist. I think I was, I was almost 17 at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Right from there, I just started, you know, mowing lawns and doing odd jobs um, just to make a living because I never wanted to ask my parents for money ever again. You know, Mm -hmm. I didn't want to put them in that position. I never asked them for money and I just didn't want to be that kid that was always just take, take, take. So yeah, that's kind of how it started. And then I worked that lawn care company up quite a bit. And then I remember one week, everything that I had ended up breaking. Mm -hmm. All the equipment I had, all weed whackers and push mowers, riding lawn mowers, everything broke in the same week. And I just Ugh. took it as a sign, said, this is my next, 
this is the next step. I need to pivot to something else. Mm -hmm. So I was doing odd jobs at the time and uh, I had done an odd job for a client of mine that found me on Craigslist and it was a moving job. Mm -hmm. And so after that job, uh, you know, the guy handed me like $250 for, you know, four hours of work. And I'm like, wow, Mm -hmm. you know, all I did was bring myself to the job and he paid me for my labor. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of how I started my next company, which was called Precision Packing College Movers. And so basically Mm -hmm. I wanted to start a company. I saw that all the companies that were getting pretty large back then, none of them had assets of their own. So I kind of wanted to stage a company where I could, it could be what I wanted it to be at any point in time. I could start it, stop it, which would give me entire freedom Mm -hmm. of being an entrepreneur. So I started that moving company. We started out just providing labor for people that wanted to move Mm -hmm. and Uh, It did really well. We did really well with that for, I think I ran that company for three, three and a half years, but I knew it wasn't, Mm -hmm. I knew it wasn't something I wanted to do long-term. I was treating it more as, you know, a a money grab to get to the next level so that I could get more passive income because I knew that passive income was the way to get the lifestyle of, you know, you never have to worry about money, Mm -hmm. uh, which Mm -hmm. is not what I grew up with. So that's kind of how that went, you know, and I ran Mm -hmm. that company and then, you know, I started doing a lot of research. I remember sitting in my parents' basement, had a fair amount of money in in the bank. And I just was like, you know what, what are, what are, what are rich people do with this money? I had never Mm -hmm. had money before. People around me really didn't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. So there was really no one I could ask. And I was like, you know, you heard all the regular things of put it in IRAs and do stocks and all this stuff. Uh, But I really wanted to know how, like, the super wealthy make lives for themselves and make money work for them so that they can do things that they were really passionate about. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that was really important to me was I'm talking a lot about money, but the reason why I'm doing that is because money, for me, it was the way to do the things that I really wanted to do, which for me, it was, I really, I really wanted to be a uh, motivational speaker. I wanted to speak Mm -hmm. to people, motivate people to become, you know, their best in their lives. And that's, what's really driving me at this point. So Mm -hmm. that's where I was leading. Where you started. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And I needed something that was going to be able to give me that lifestyle. Um, because when you don't have money, you're really focusing on yourself and your, your immediate family. Mm-hmm. But yeah. when you have super wealth, you can kind of focus on other people because, you know, your passive income line is is supporting you. So mm-hmm. I knew that that was a big thing for me. Yeah. So do you, and it seems like, you know, growing up um, not having much that really I mean, it definitely spurred you on to to work harder. I mean, it, it, it work hard seeing what your dad did. It's, it really yeah. gave you your work ethic. Um, yeah, so it, it was that. Like. Yeah, totally. It was that. And then, you know, in college, I was all about money at one point. You know, I was strictly all about money. I thought life revolved around money. Right. And then in college, I went through a very traumatic experience. And, you know, after that, I had a lot of internal time with myself. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of did a lot of searching in myself for what is the world about? Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't about money and, and that's a lot of things that I found. And so at that point, you know, I, I did a lot of soul searching and it's like, what's, what's life about? What is the purpose of us being here? And I genuinely believe through that process that I found that the true currency is not money. The true currency in life is value that you're bringing to other people on the planet. And mm-hmm. when that hit me to my core, I was like, you know what? That's so true. It's, Mm. you know, the value that you're providing other people is the true currency in the entire world. No matter what part of the world you're in, you can go to any place in the entire world. The true currency in every single organization, tribe, whatever, wherever you are, is the value you're providing other people. That's Mm. awesome. Yeah. And money is just a byproduct of that in our society because that's just how we made it. So typically you provide the value. You don't really ever have to worry about money. So that's kind of what I started focusing on after that point was I want to touch as many lives in the world as I possibly can. Mm. Wow. That was the transition for me. And 
Mm-hmm. Real estate was my liaison to that. So it seems like you've you've always kind of had lots of irons in the fire. Do you feel that that is a result of having goals and, and wanting to progress in, in what you're doing? Or is there something just very basic in and appealing to you about that, about having lots of things going on or always kind of looking at, okay, what's the next thing? Just a part of who you are or is it a means to an end? It's just a part of who I am. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of people, mm-hmm. you'll hear it all the time that say, don't put too many irons in the fire, you know, focus on one thing. That's how you're going to get there. But I genuinely couldn't do that. I was calculating it the other day. I have about 25 streams of income. And I don't think that I could narrow that down to one. Because that's Mm -hmm. just not how my my mind works. That's not how Mm -hmm. I operate. Uh, Because I see so many opportunities, because that's how I train my brain. I I see opportunities every single day. Mm -hmm. I've come to the point where I have to push off many of the opportunities. And a lot of the time you hear, you know, don't, you know, people follow the shiny object. For me, it's like Mm a big part of who I am is I genuinely believe that human beings don't know what they're capable of. Like, Mm -hmm. I, you know, a lot of people set goals. One of my things is that I do not set goals because I don't think that anybody knows what they're absolutely capable of. So that's kind of why I pick up many irons in the fire is because it satisfies a part of me that would die if I wasn't doing that. So Mm. for me, instead of doing something that wasn't productive, such Mm -hmm. as, you know, let's say sitting down and watching Netflix for hours and hours and hours every single night. Okay. I find another stream of income that is fun for me. So Mm. instead of sitting there and playing video games at night, I find a company that I can start and make money with. That's what's fun for me. So that's how I use my free time is how can I build myself and I want to find something new that's exciting and that's also satisfies my mind and okay, learning something new. It sounds like you're super creative in that aspect. I mean, we all have these different areas of creativity and it sounds like for you, you're very creative in coming up with these different streams of income, these different opportunities. That's really cool. Yeah, exactly. That's like my creative is Mm -hmm. learning something new Mm. and being good at it. Going from a start to something worth talking about is not easy. Right. And You know, I really am out here trying to prove that you can really do anything that you like actually want to do. And I've done that in many different industries. It's kind of like a a part of me at this point. Like how many industries can I do well in, you know? Right. Mm. So that's one of the ones was being a realtor. Yeah. So tell us, how did you get into real estate as as kind of one of your main occupations? How did that all transpire? Yeah. So again, to bring it back just for a second, my moving company was the transition. So Mm -hmm. there was a transition point in there where I wanted to stop being a mover and working physically with my hands and my back and start working Mm -hmm. with my mind. I needed that moving company to get me out of the place where I was. I needed Mm -hmm. to use my hands and my back to make money. But after a certain point, I knew I needed to start using my mind. So I had bought property in 2017 to start getting passive income. So I bought 10 units in nine months in 2017. And I just got super addicted to the real estate and what it was all about. Mm -hmm. Um, But I wanted to be a person of my craft. You know, I didn't want to just not know anything. I was using realtors at the time. And I just felt like I just wanted to be a person of my craft and really hone in on real estate as a whole. So Mm -hmm. I started doing things like I got my uh, certification for home inspecting and took the MLO test for mortgages. And then I took my test for being an agent. And I took it from there. I I didn't necessarily get my license to help other people. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to buy and sell my own property. And that Mm -hmm. was valuable to me because I didn't have to contact somebody and ask them to get in the property. So I became an agent to pretty much help myself. And Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, I started noticing a trend with a lot of different people. So I noticed the trend that everybody was talking about new agents, okay? First year agents, not really ever doing that well. If you make an X amount of money, it's gonna be really good. And it was like, mm. the, the number was low, you know? And the, it's kind of like a thing in our industry where it's like, everybody doesn't really think of first year agents as being very successful. And it, it's mm-hmm. seen as being hard. And I mean, mm-hmm. I heard it from family members, friends, people in my office like yeah just hold on for the first year it's gonna be really tough and you know I was like well I'm not really trying to be an agent like that but 
the more I heard it, the more it really started to bug me. <laughs> like a little it, fire. Yeah, it really started to bug me. And that's how I, always, I hate it when people tell me I can't do something. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I, it's just like the more people start telling me like, hey, you know, good luck. You know, it's, it's really tough industry to be in. I remember the, the day I set, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. And I'm going to show these people that it's not as difficult as they think. But the major th- reason why I really wanted to hit it out the ballpark was for all of the new agents that were coming in behind me. I wanted to prove my theory of you can be something very quickly if you just believe that you can do it. And so mm-hmm. that's kind of what I was out to prove was my theory. You know, you don't have to be an expert in, in an industry to do really well in it really quickly. So that's kind mm-hmm. of what I set out to do in that first year, I think I closed about 40 something sales and I was rookie of the year by a landslide. Wow. And, you know, I was even recognized on a national level. And that's kind of where I started the whole flip the switch at the same mm-hmm. time. My uh, motivational brand flipped the switch. That's the year I started that. So I not only did that business as, an, as a realtor, but I bought 22 units in that same year. I started two other companies in real estate. One of them was with my business partner, Andrew Maley. And so it was just really, it was a really satisfying year. And I really Mm -hmm. needed that. The year prior to that was really weird for me because, you know, I was going through the process of stopping working with my hands and my back to using my mind. Mm -hmm. And that transition was very weird because I was always very physical with my work. And then all of Mm -hmm. a sudden I was just kind of, on a computer for hours a day. And yeah. I, I got to the end of the day a lot of the time and I was like, wow, I'm being really lazy. But I was making more <laughs> money than I had ever made. You know, yeah. so it was just a really weird transition. I felt guilty at the end of the year because I didn't I knew I did not reach my true potential. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started the whole flip the switch movement. I was like, mm-hmm. this next year is not going to be like that. I need to take every single opportunity I possibly can mm-hmm. So that I get to the end of the year and I can say, I gave it my all. Like I did everything I possibly could. So along with, you know, flipping the switch and and kind of motivating yourself as well as motivating others, you spend a lot of time developing members on your team. Mm -hmm. Uh, What feeds that fire and and how does that link in with with your aspirations as a motivational speaker and just your experience Mm -hmm. leading up to that and, and how you relate all of that to your team members? I mean, growing up, I mean, still to this day, I have never had a mentor. And it just kind of came about that way because I started looking for a real estate mentor when I first got into real estate. I had just bought 10 units in 2017 and I had no idea what I was doing. I just wanted to take action and figure it out. So I had asked a a fair amount of people to be my mentor and everybody said that they were too busy, which now fast forward a couple of years, I understand why they said that. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, I was extremely frustrated when I was going through that because Mm -hmm. I had no idea what was going on. But I'm the type of person where, you know, I get enough no's, I'm just going to say, screw it. I'll just do it myself. Yeah, Um, exactly. That's exactly what happened to me. I just said, I'll just find my way through this by myself. And I thank myself every day for actually having that mindset because I was able to scale so much faster because I was struggling every single day changing at a rapid pace, understanding the business from the inside out. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't necessarily get that when you have a mentor to just go to and answer every question you have. You don't get that internal learning. But one thing that I really wanted to do was I got to a point where I had quite a few units and then I was reached out to by Andrew and he said, I really want to get into real estate. Would you mentor me? And at that point, I'm all about helping other people. I didn't think that I knew enough at that point to like teach people, but I knew that I knew enough to help someone that he was 19 when he first texted me about helping him. Mm. And so we started working together about with real estate, but I really wanted to, I was passionate about it because of where I came from. I didn't have anybody when I was his age telling me that it was okay not to go to college. Right. And that's Mm -hmm. something that I felt really strongly about was that I knew that I was an entrepreneur and I knew that I didn't need college to succeed in life. You know, so I I knew where he was at and I was just very passionate about like, okay, let me help you help yourself and get to a point where you're really cranking it as an entrepreneur by the time you're 21 and all your friends are graduating college. 
Um, mm. That was one of the things that I was super passionate about was just helping the younger generations. Mm -hmm. You know, we've brought teammates on after Andrew. We've brought people into our, you know, circle and have mm -hmm. done the same thing for those people. That's and because the younger generations, they really don't believe that they're capable of anything until the future. Right. That's right. we hear all that a lot. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. But why aren't why aren't people asking, what do you want to be right now? You know, when right. you're younger, True. because these yep. younger guys and these younger uh, women and all these younger people, they have the ability with the industries that we have today with just the Internet as a whole. They have the mm -hmm. ability to do some really wild stuff when they're mm -hmm. younger. They just mm -hmm. don't have everybody telling them that they can do it. You know, what would you say are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned just even in the last year? I had to learn the hard way to bring other people into my world. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I've always been the guy that's always been like, I'll just, do, I can do it myself. I can do it myself. I can do it myself until three, four years later where I have an actual, you know, substantial business where I can't do everything myself. It's, mm. so, it's something that's much larger than me. And that's something that I've learned in the last year is that I really need to rely on other people to help yeah. me build what I'm trying to build. You know, that's, it sounds cliche, but it was really something that I needed to learn on like the hard way because <laughs> I was always yeah. doing yep. things myself. And I feel like you guys you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think it's, I used to hear this quote and it was, if you have a dream, you got to build a team. And it's, yeah. it's so true. It's like, you got to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you, that know more than you, that, you know, for, for us, that's huge. And then be, do what you're doing, give back to the younger generation and be that for them. So it's just this, this constant cycle. We had the best year we've ever had this year. And, you know, it, the, the numbers alone are just staggering because Andrew's my business partner. I told him, I, I don't like employees really. When I first started, I wanted an actual business partner. That was mm -hmm. going to be able to you know, handle things with me. So Andrew's a business partner of mine. And, you know, just the fact that it was basically him and I, and then all of a sudden we were able to build what we did this year and the years prior is just, honestly, it's mind blowing when we get to the end of the year and we're like, wow, we actually did really well. We didn't even realize mm -hmm. it. <laughs> yeah. Because we're, we're the type of people that just have our head down and we're just right. taking day by day. And then you kind of like put your, take take your head up at the end of the year, and you're like, "Wow, that was that was wild." Yeah, I think I think the the two things I I take out of that is one that I've had to learn myself because I I can be the same way. No, I can take care of it. I can do it. I can do it, and mm -hmm. that can be such a huge strength that you can be right. self starting, that you can right. be self motivating, that you can be self contained enough to be like, "Well, I'll just do it." Right. But that can also right. turn into a, your greatest strength can also mm -hmm. become a weakness at a certain point if For you sure. if you don't learn to adapt as the situation changes. Yeah. And and as well, just, you know, what you say about giving back to other people and giving them the leg up as well and that you don't necessarily need to be an expert. You just need to know more than the person that you're trying to help. Right. Right. You know, you just have to get them to where you're at. That was the big thing for us. A lot of the younger people are drawn to what we're doing because Andrew's so young. You know, they see mm -hmm. Andrew being 19, starting to, buy, you know, buy his own property and then started to you know flip homes and do different crazy things. And you know, and then we started to attract other younger people. Like we helped a, a 19 year old buy a property, 20 year old, 18 year old. Um, these, these people are buying real multifamilies when they're this young. And they mm. had like, for instance, the kid that was 19, he didn't even have an idea. He wanted to get into real estate, but he had no clue that he could even approve for a property That's so awesome. until he came into our lives. It was kind of funny because he told me that, you know, he was following us forever and he actually like tricked me into showing him a property just so he could meet me at time. <laughs> Smart like, kid. He, yeah, he just reached out to me and was like, hey, can I look at this property? He wasn't even approved for it. And I showed it to him and he's like, yeah, I don't really approve for this, but you know, I just wanted to meet you. And I was like, oh, cool. You know, come to the office, talk some more. And he was like, yeah, I just really want to get into real estate. And at the time he was working at Hannaford and his salary wasn't the best as a 19 year old, but I was like, I can make this work. And we got him pre-qualified. Two months later, he was into a four unit right in Gorham. And he completely replaced his income wow. just from one property. So he quit his job. He started working in real estate full time with us. And it was just like a really cool experience. You know, it was really yeah. satisfying to see somebody follow their dreams so quickly. 
can you tell us a little bit about just t- tying into that? Tell us a little bit about um, the fun that you set up in Westbrook for this past holiday season to give back. Tell us about that. I am a- extremely passionate about just being a good human being providing value to as many people as I possibly can. That's really what keeps me going. And, you know, it was just one of those things where this year I got to a point at the end of the year, I had the biggest year I've ever had as an, as an agent. And it was just, I just knew it was time. I I had the, you know, the base, you know, I have a good business going and I just knew it was that transition time to be like, okay, how do I give back to the community that I, that I operate in? And mm-hmm. we're working with the mayor as well, uh, Mayor Foley here in Westbrook. And we're creating this fund that basically I'll do 20% of all profits, that all the properties that we sell in Westbrook. And then I'm going to be relying on Mayor Foley to help us distribute this money every single year. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So, That's fantastic. Yeah. So it, it's going to go towards, you know, if there's families in need that come up or individuals or even just community uh, projects that are going on. If they need yeah, money, we, so cool. we're a supporter of that. Yeah. One of the questions that we love to ask, yeah. uh, because we are admitted inspiration junkies, is uh, who or what inspires you? That's that's an interesting question for me. And a lot of people ask me that. <laughs> so I, ha- mm-hmm. I get a lot of people contacting me over social media and, hey, what, what inspires you to just keep going? What motivates you? And You know, I'm the type of person that always finds my true answer to everything that I'm answering. I don't like cliche answers. I I find an answer that is true to me. And my answer to this, and it's going to, to a lot of people listening to this, it's going to sound a little egotistical, but I want you to really boil it down and, and really think about it. So the person that motivates me the most is my future self. Mm-hmm. The things that I have gone through and the things that I have done up until this point in my life, I've gone through a lot of things in my 29 years on the planet that a lot of people don't ever go through. And mm-hmm. I think that through that process, I was like, who am I doing this for? Who motivates me? And honestly, I don't idolize other human beings. I'm kind of a, at a point where you know I've seen a lot of famous people in my life. And I just kind of walk up to them. Hey, how you doing? And I try not to reflect myself in other human beings because that's when a lot of weird things happen. So Mm -hmm. I try not to compare myself to anybody, but what I'm, what I'm motivated by is my future self. Who do I want Mm -hmm. my future self to be, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of what motivates me every single day to do work and to do, to keep going, to push more and to buy more property, to help more people is everything that you're doing today is actually making you in the future. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's, yeah, Never so thought of that. It's really interesting way of thinking of it. But that's the only person on this planet that motivates me is my future self. That's and, so cool. And who I Never actually of genuinely that. want to be when I get older. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's fantastic. It is the one tr- it is the truest comparison that you don't have right. to be better than everybody else. Yeah, you no. just have to be better than what you've been. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's and that's I genuinely feel that. Like I when I'm in a position, even when I'm in competition with people, I'm constantly competing against myself. I'm not competing mm-hmm. against anybody else in the room. Right. And I think that, that scares a lot of people because it's not normal, but mm-hmm. it's it's just who I am. I don't need to compete right. with this person or this person or this person. I genuinely want everybody to succeed and mm-hmm. because I'm only fighting against myself. You know, right. I, I'm internally competing against me every day. Because I want to make my future self proud and motivated and happy about what I was doing that. Yeah, and I think that can be scary for other people because if you are truly doing that, you have to have a real honest picture of, of who you are right now and who you've been. And right. that, could be a very, that could be a very humbling and scary thing to do yep. on right. a moment-by-moment, day-by-day basis is to really have an honest picture of, of who you've been and what you've done and, and having to really look at all that right especially in our society today you know we see a lot of it on a daily basis of especially with this with social media and how the social media has gone Mm -hmm. you know you see a lot of people that are acting in a way that they're they might not even actually be that way oh yeah Mm -hmm. so you just have to be true to yourself yeah and that's one thing that i always do is just trying to find my true north in every situation i don't care if it's right or wrong to somebody else if it's my true north, I'm following that. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's good. 
Well, thank you so much, Tyler. We really appreciate you coming yeah, on the this show. this has been fantastic. Uh, this has been educational for us and inspiring, and uh, hopefully it has been that way for, for our listeners as well. Uh, we'll be sure to include uh, links to uh, all your social media pages, contact information for you, for the Hall Group. And uh, just once again, thank you for sharing yes, thank all you of this. so much. It's and, been uh, so much. And we wish you great success in 2022. Yes, yeah, so many good nuggets there, and uh, we'll definitely um, we'll have to have you on the show again someday when you finish your book. All right. Sounds good to me. (laughs) Thank you so much, Tyler. Once again, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Gorham Savings Bank, and encourage you to check them out through the link in the show notes. And thank you again for listening. 